Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the CKC channel. I'm your host, Fire Master Calvin Klaassen, and welcome to another episode of Reflections Season 3. And uh, yes, it's it's been a good season, uh, as were the other two, but uh, I think this one is uh, actually getting more and more exciting. And yes, if you're new to the show, don't forget to press the follow button. If you want to, to throw some questions in for our special guest this evening, um, you need to press the follow button, of course, and uh, then don't uh, wait till the last uh, few minutes to, to throw them in, because we do have a schedule, and um, we would like to, to, to throw the guest uh, questions in uh, about 20 minutes into the show. So uh, we have, we've got a special guest this evening. He's actually the creator of uh, the lovely website uh, Chess Drum, and I'll leave the full introduction to Dr. Boa himself. I think they know each other for a bit longer. So I'm quite keen to, to get to know our special guest a bit more this evening. I think it's going to be a great show. So, yes, um, I think that's about it for now. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to switch over to Dr. Boa to give the proper introduction. Yes. Good evening, Calvin, and good evening, viewers. Uh, it's lovely to uh, to be on the show number four here tonight in uh, in season three. And uh, to tonight, uh, Calvin and viewers, our guest comes from New York City. Um, he's a good friend of Africa and South Africa. Uh, Dr. Daim Shabazz is, of course, the creator uh, and founder of Chess Drum, and uh, they've been around for more than 20 years. And many of you would have read these articles uh, about uh, chess players from Africa and, and elsewhere uh, that uh, he chronicles from around the world. Uh, Dr. Shabazz is also a lecturer at the university uh, in Florida, and he will tell us about his uh, lectures in, in business uh, as, as well. Daim? Welcome to Reflection Season Four, uh, Season Three, Episode Four, and uh, I'm so pleased to have you here. Welcome, uh, Daim. Thank you for having me, Lyndon and Calvin. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and I am really excited uh, about doing the show and just looking forward to interacting with the audience, answering some questions, and talking about chess in the African diaspora, and then showing a couple of games at the end. Yep, no, no, we're certainly looking forward to, to those games, Naim. Now, Naim, where did it all start? Who taught you to play chess? It's very interesting. I, I actually grew up in Chicago. Okay. Uh, a, lot of, a, a lot of people think I'm from other places. They think I'm from Atlanta and New York. But I, I actually grew up in Chicago, and nobody in my family knew how to play chess, so I didn't learn there. But uh, one night, I was walking in the neighborhood, and I saw two boys playing chess underneath a lamp, a street lamp. And I didn't, I knew it was chess. I didn't know what they were doing. I didn't know how to play. And they were just sitting there, and I was so intrigued that they were so focused on that game under a lamp at night. And, you know, at that time, we, we like to do physical activities and athletics, but they were sitting here. And so I was impressed by that. And I went home and got an encyclopedia and looked up chess. Right. And then day I started, um, I got my board and we had, uh, we happened to have one of those cheap boards at home. And I, I set up the pieces and I, I learned the moves. So you were self-taught? Self-taught, yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. And, and, and how old were you when, you when you sort of came across these guys under the streetlight? I was about 13. So you, you go, relative to today, that's rather late. Yeah, yeah, but, that's rather late. Yeah, it, it, it's quite late. But, of course, I had no, no influence and no environment in my neighborhood. So, uh, But it just so happens that once I started playing, I started running into more people that played chess. So, uh, and, and fortunately for me, I went to a high school that had 100 chess players in the, in the club. Uh, right. it's, a, it's a black high school, but we had 100 players in the chess club. And we had a very dedicated coach who was um, a big advocate in the city for, for chess. And so that's where my interest uh, started. 
And and uh, even so, so when you joined your your school chess club, did uh, did they have a ladder system? Did uh, and did you guys uh, play against other schools there? Because we're always reading about the state championships and then the big ones. So so how was it at at, at your level when you first joined there at high school? So at high school, I lost my very first game in high school to a scholar's mate. Oh no! <laughs> I lost my very first game, I lost to a scholar's mate. I, you know, I sat down. I didn't know what I was doing, and so the guy played Queen Tex takes F seven mate, and there were other people uh, sitting around, and I was like incredulous. I was like, okay, well, uh, it never happened again. But that that's. <laughs> A lot of us, that's our first experience. We'll, we'll lose a game very badly. But then after that, um, I started getting better. And one of my classmates says, wow, he, he says, you ought to join the chess club. And so I joined. And the chess coach gives everybody a 700 rating. So you All start right. at a 700 and you work your way up. And yeah. So he had a system that he calculated. He uses his own calculator. Well, he used... Um, uh, it was a computer, but he used to run off the ratings, and he used to post them up, and then we would all run to the, the rating chart and see where we were. So with 100 players in a chess club, it was extremely competitive. So I of went course. from 700 to 1,000 in my first year, from 1,000 to 1,300, and then from 1,300 to 1,500. Now, that doesn't sound like much, 1,500 ELO, but when you go 800 points, yeah, yeah, then yeah, yeah. that's significant improvement. Now, uh, and, and, uh, and of course, what, all this was, was in the first year? Well, it was three years it took me to get to uh, 800, to improve 800 points. And by the time I was a senior, in between my se junior and senior year, I studied six to eight hours a day. I was studying. Yeah. And so I went from board six to first board. And over no. over the summer. And, no, that uh, when, when you when you were studying, who was your what was your favorite books that you were looking at? Well, you know, it's interesting. Then I studied a lot of openings, and so I was a very uh, I was a uh, Sicilian aficionado. So, uh, but I knew all the openings. It's interesting. I was watching one of the the uh, shows you did with Johannes uh, Mabusela, and he mentioned the book, the nineteen fifty three uh, Zurich. Uh, which yes. is actually still one of my favorite books. And it was in, very influential in the time I was studying that, that period of time that helped me to make that jump because then I started to understand the systems a lot better, more so than just mo moves and patterns and tactics. So I got a deeper yeah. understanding because that book is well annotated. And so that yeah. was one of the books. Um, uh, that I studied, but a lot of the other books were like Psychology and Chess by Nikolai Krogas, well, which was yep. very interesting. Uh, Think Like a Grandmaster, Play Like a Grandmaster were uh, two other books uh, that I studied, as well as a lot of other opening books. I was really uh, into openings, and so I knew a lot of opening preparation in 20 to 30 moves, uh, some almost into the end game. Um, but to my demise, I neglected the end game, which um, we'll talk about later. <laughs> well, let me tell you that our previous guest, uh, Grandmaster Strikovic, he said you must start studying chess at the end game stage again. Yeah. That was his, his advice last week to, to the viewers and to ourselves. Exactly. And you know, one thing, when I got above 2000 ELO, I picked up a book called the Basford in uh, Encyclopedia of Chess Endings. Yeah, the BCE. By, yeah, by um, Spielman, Tisdale, and Wade. And I went through yeah. that whole book. And I really could not, um, I was so impressed with the beauty of endings. I just did not have that exposure of how beautiful chess can be by going through those endings. And some of them were actually miraculous. Yeah, the, yeah the, I know. The, the, one, the one where you're trying to stop an H pawn with your knight, and the knight is all the way, the, the white knight is all the way on the queen side, and then it makes it over all the way to the 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 uh, king side just in time. That yep. to me, that's yep. amazing that that you can have those types of possibilities. And so those were some of the books that kind of helped me to appreciate chess and develop a passion for it. 
but of course, then um, academics took more of a role in my life. And so I didn't have as much time to study. Um, of course, yeah. of course. Now, but but Naim, just before we go to your academics, because I want to ask that question, what you studied, um, who were your chess heroes growing up? I mean, you, you were playing in an era when was it Kasparov, Karpov? I mean, the two Ks were dominant in, in that time. So so who were your heroes in, in growing up? Well, believe it or not, and in, in people who know me in the in the States and, and know my style, they would not believe that Karpov was my first serious study. I studied his games because it, this might sound silly, but I like the way he, where, or how he placed his pieces. His knights yeah. always seemed to be together. His bishops were together. His rooks were together. And I thought his, the coordination of his pieces was very instructive. And so I studied yeah. his, his best games. I studied his, uh, all of his games. Uh, yeah. I followed tournaments. And even though I'm a very tactical player, that, that helped to uh, solidify my play. Uh, yeah. I tried studying tall once, and I got a headache, and I said, that's enough. I, I can't do Mikhail Tall. Uh, I studied <laughs> Fisher's games. Fisher, you know, I liked uh, his games, but it was Karpov who was actually one of the most uh, influential players in my, um, my evolution. But, you know, it's interesting because... Um... Kenny Solomon also made that point that uh, when his brother Maxwell went to, to, to the Philippines for the first time, he ended up studying Karpov's games at, at, at home. And, and Karpov just with those quiet Bishop E2 maneuvers. And, and then, of course, if one thinks of that game against uh, Unzika, Bishop A7, and then he wins by playing Bishop H5 later. I mean, those are fantastic concepts. And I mean, we got to, uh, we got to applaud Karpov also just for, for that type of uh, positional understanding that he exhibited at, at that time without computers and anything else. This was just pure raw talent. And you know, there's a misconception about Karpov because a lot of people think that he has a stale, uh, uh, his style is very slow. He's ultra positional. And he is that, but in his early days, he was not that type of player. He put his pieces in the right places, but when he unleashed his attack, it was, it was brutal. And, yeah, and I kind yeah. of, I, I liked the, the mixture of positional and then this attacking chess that he played. And I think that's something that's overlooked with Karpov. People yeah. think he's, just, he's, he's like Petrosian. You know, he's just putting his pieces in defensive positions, but he was lethal on the yeah. attack. Yeah. yeah, no, no, he's, he's I, I mean, and for him to have been as dominant as he, as he was, I mean, from what was it, 73, 74, uh, I mean, Fisher wasn't really playing after 73, so in theory, Karpov was the top player from about 73, 74, when he, I think he beat Korshno in, in the candidates, but, but Daim, uh, that's a bit of the, the, the chess side, what, what did you study at university? Okay, uh, this is this is interesting. So you all won't think that I'm crazy, but I have I do have a story. I actually started out as a, a computer science undergrad major. So I have a degree in computer science, and I used to like studying computer chess because that's that's the kind of bridge between chess and my academic field. And so I used to always get the computer chess bulletins and watch computers play each other. I thought that was very fascinating. And then I worked in the computer industry for, uh, well, I was a programmer for about a year before I decided that I didn't want to sit in the office for eight or nine hours writing code. So I went to a career counselor and she looked at my, my college background and my activities and she, she said, you need to be on the marketing side of computers. And so I ended up getting a position at a computer manufacturer working in marketing, which was a wonderful uh, opportunity. But then that company started to run into all kinds of problems. Uh, it was a smaller company, so it couldn't survive with the rest of the sharks. Um, but by that time, I had decided to return to graduate school to study for my MBA in marketing. But one thing that happened before I studied my MBA, I went to Egypt. I took a trip to Egypt, and that oh. was a life, that was a life changer because now I want to do something international. So after I did my MBA, I ended up uh, entering an international affairs program where I got my doctorate in international affairs. 
And so now I teach international business. My research, my initial research was on e-business and using e-business to increase international trade. So I kind of mix all of my different areas together. And so I've been teaching international business for 23 years now. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. And, and which university is it in Florida? I'm at Florida A&M University, which is in Tallahassee, Florida. It's the capital. Uh, we have about 190,000 people here. So it's a small, uh, it's a college town, not much chess here. Not, not a whole lot of chess, but uh, certainly if you go down to Orlando and Miami and Fort Lauderdale, uh, there's a lot more. And, and Boca Raton, there's a lot more activity uh, in chess. But I'm at the very north part of Florida, and it's an eight-hour drive down to Miami. Now, now, now you know, Daim, that um, South Africa has always been on the international trade route. Because, of course, when they tried to, to, to get to India, they needed to come around Cape Town. So you, you found all of those guys, when people talk about the Silk Road, they also talk about the maritime route from Europe and Portugal right to, around Cape Town. And then they get to Singapore and, and Indonesia and Malaysia and, and, and the like. So, so we've been actually part of the international trade routes for, for centuries. You know, from, so I, I hope you're adding that to your, to your curriculum. Yes. Most definitely. I talk about the trading routes from the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, to Equatorial Guinea, to the Cape Coast, to the Spice Islands, Madagascar, to India, and, and then the rest of Asia. I mean, they had yes. these routes that, uh, and I definitely uh, include that into into my uh, into my lectures. Well, if you if you ever want to, to read something about uh, the Chinese coming to, to Africa, there's a great book that uh, shows that China visited uh, South Africa in 1421, and then they closed they closed their borders uh, after that for whatever reason. But Aim, let's get to to one of the things where you became well known. What made you start the chess drum? That's a most common question that I get. Uh, I do have the, an essay that I wrote uh, on the chess drum that talks about the evolution of it. And I'm also writing a book right now uh, where I'm telling the story about uh, the chess drum. It's interesting that when I was coming up in Chicago, I played most of my tournaments in Illinois. I didn't play many yep. outside of the state. And I had a conversation with uh, this player after the tournament was over. And he says, we started talking about black players and we were naming some of the players that we both knew. And he says, well, where are the black grandmasters? Now this was the, this was the early eighties, maybe 83 or 84. He said, where are the black grandmasters? And so I, I looked, I'm like, where I, I don't know, <laughs> you know, cause I'm thinking, I know the handful of masters in our circle, but that question stuck in my mind for a long time. And I said to myself, okay, I don't know. I'm going to find out. So from that point, I started doing research on players in the African diaspora. I started looking around. I contacted a number of people. And then um, one of the officials in the Illinois uh, Chess Association gave me the name of Jerry Bebo, whom you yep. know. And yep. we started exchanging letters and he was so happy, so excited. I told him about my idea that I wanted to maybe establish a network in, for the African diaspora. And he was, he was just very excited. And he started sending me all kinds of uh, literature about the work that uh, he had done. Yep. But yep. The, the turning point was uh, meeting uh, someone that you, you, you may know, uh, I think, uh, Maurice Ashley. Of I met course. him in 1989 at the U.S. Open. And um, it was interesting because that next summer, I was in graduate school in New York. I went to graduate. Uh, I, I did an internship in New York. So I called Maurice up and I say, well, I'm coming to New York. Uh, let, let's meet up. And so he says, Washington Square Park, where they play chess. So I met Maurice and I was telling him about my idea. We had had phone calls before that, and I was talking about this network. So I had a, a marketing plan that I had um, that I had written for a class 
about this network. So I let him have a yeah. copy and uh, he looked it over and he gave some feedback and he says, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good idea. We actually went to the World Open in 1990, not as players, but as spectators. So I was selling this idea of establishing a network and having a quarterly magazine. So I was supposed to have a magazine first and I was going to send it all over the world and it was going right. to deal with the diaspora. But um, what yeah. happened after that was that I was so busy in graduate school, I didn't have time to do a magazine and of to course. build a yeah. network. Yeah. And so um, I graduated with my doctorate in 98 and I yeah. went to, came to Florida. And in 1999, Maurice Ashley became a grandmaster. And it's interesting right. because I went to my mailbox and I got this magazine, Chess Life, and I opened and I saw him on the cover. And I said, that's the sign that, that this is the time that I now need to do this, this idea, this network. But bear in mind, by that time, the internet had blossomed. And yeah, I said, yeah. well, instead of doing a magazine, why don't I just do a website? Yeah. And so yeah. in 2001, I, you know, got the, a few pages together and February 12, 2001, I launched the chess drum and it's, it's been quite a ride, a 20 year ride. You can see behind me, I have the 20 year anniversary celebration. Yep. yep. It's been a lot of hard work and, you know, I would say not in a negative way, but sometimes it's a thankless job that nobody knows how hard you're working, but, you know, sometimes people will give you, uh, you know, they will give you praise and they would appreciate what you're doing, but it's a lot of hard work. Well, but, but Naeem, let me, let me, and be the first one to say congratulations and well done on, on 20 years, uh, you know, of rich research. And, and I can tell you that um, I made extensive use of, of your website um, when I was writing my two books, because um, you are probably one of the only sources that one can go to for things like the African championships, because I, I was struggling to find uh, people that have written about some of our early tournaments. And, and I just realized without the chess drum, we won't have that history. So from my side, thank you very much for, for doing what you did by deciding to write about those tournaments. And yes, it's a thankless task, but I can tell you, You've got many admirers and supporters right down here in South Africa, as well as in, in Africa. So well done. And uh, when, when can we expect to, uh, to buy that book? Well, I'm working on it now. And of course, life always gets in the way. But I'm, I'm and looking... when will you be, be launching? Well, I'm, I'm actually looking at probably more like 2023, the early part of 2023, uh, maybe earlier. It, it may be earlier, but I'm sure. working now. I've got a lot of other things that I, that I have. I'm actually on sabbatical now from my university, but I'm working on a very major project uh, to develop a curriculum. And so now I'm, I'm doing all of these things at the same time. But you, you know, writing a book, as you know, is not an easy task. It, it's, um, it, you have to be very yeah. precise, like in chess. You have to document your sources. You have to double and triple check. You've got to get a copy editor. You've got to get a proofreader. You've got to do all of these things. And I know this because I wrote a book on Emory Tate, International Master Emory Tate. And yep. it's a, the book is called Triple X Glam. And it, it was um, quite, um, it took quite an effort to, to put that together. No, I can well believe it and, and, and well done with that because I, I remember that Kenny Sullivan still annotated a game or something uh, in, in Emory yes. State's uh, book as, as, as well. Uh, but thank you very much. I've got a few questions here still in my book, but I'm, it's now 25 past seven. Let's, let's check with Calvin if there's any questions from the viewers. Thank you, Daim. But I'm going to be back. Calvin, over to you. Okay, yes, uh, I'm back, guys. Interesting stuff. And um, yes, we've got a couple of questions in the chat box. Uh, let's see. So our first question is from Boom Shaka. Okay, it's a two-point question, but I think the second question was kind of already um, spoken about. So let's see. Boom Shaka says, good evening, everyone. Just tuned in. Question one, what is your favorite chess? Uh, what is one of your favorite chess moments? 
So I don't know. You can maybe oh. talk about tournament or I don't know traveling. I, I, I don't so know. <laughs> I have I have so many moments. Um, I've I've attended six Olympiads. I've I've covered six different Olympiads, and th- those are always uh, special. Um, I enjoy, and I've been able to travel to a number of of countries. I mentioned to you uh, before the show started. I've been to South Africa four times. And two of those times, I was able to meet with uh, the chess community and visited the uh, Ruben Salimo and the um, Claremont Chess Club um, and Eric uh, Takawira. Uh, I, I met him there. I didn't play. Um, I played at the Claremont Chess Club. There was a blitz tournament. Um, but th- And those were good times. But I think one of the most memorable moments I had, or two of them, was the Wilbur Page uh, Memorial, which uh, Watu Kobeza played in. That was the first time I met Watu and Kenny Solomon. They came to yeah. Harlem, New York to play in this tournament. And that was a special two weeks. That was a special event because Grayson Subica played. And then you had Michael Schleifer, who was Canadian. And then you had the other six um, players who were from the uh, U.S. Uh, it was a special moment. The energy was great. Um, And that was actually my first, uh, I think that might have been my first tournament I covered live. And the other, the other event was when I went to Jamaica with Amos Simatowe of Zambia, we were invited to Jamaica. And so he and I went there on the invitation of Ian Wilkinson, and they were wonderful hosts. And we spent uh, about five days there. Uh, we visited some schools, uh, some Atollway did some interviews, TV interviews, and then we played in the Harold Chan um, um, t- Open Tournament, which uh, Simatoe won, I think he went six out of six, and I think I scored four points, um, four out of six okay. with uh, one loss, and uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful event. Um, Ian Wilkinson, if you don't know him, uh, he is such a, he's one of my best chess um, friends and really passionate about uh, chess. And he has various roles that he has played in FIDE. So if you want to have a chess vacation, then I would recommend you go to Jamaica. Sounds like a good, good, good recommendation over there. So I'm just curious, uh, Daim, which year was that event that you, you spoke about meeting what to them? That was... Uh, 2001. 2001, okay. July 2001. Okay, interesting and, stuff. Yep. You know, the thing is, the thing is with Watu and a lot of these players, I'm writing about these players on the chess drum and how great they are and, you know, all of these games and I'm praising them. And then they come and they meet me and then they're so grateful. They're, you know, it's just humbling to 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 find out how much they uh, appreciate and Watu was just he was very great uh, gracious uh, when I when I met him and we still to this day share a very cordial uh, relationship and we uh, oftentimes will will chat on uh, through Facebook Messenger and uh, talk about some possible directions uh, for the African diaspora. Okay, uh, thanks. I am interesting stuff. Uh, the second part of this question, I. I think we've already touched on uh, Boomshaka saying, can you tell us more about chess drum? Um, maybe I can just add a little something to it if you have anything else to add, but uh, how did you get to, to the name of this? And maybe you can add anything else. Very good the- question. Very good question. So obviously this, it's uh, the article, the uh, chess articles are about chess, but the drum is, um, we know that it's a musical instrument, right? You know, all these civilizations play music using the drum, but the drum is also a communicative vehicle. A lot of societies will use the drum to communicate messages to perhaps the next village. Then that village gets the message, they hit the beat and maybe add some some pulses to it, send it to the next village, that village gets it, sends it to the next village. So I'm thinking, okay, this is intrinsically an African mode of communication. So, and I'm covering the African diaspora, chess drum. This drum is being used to to spread the word of chess to the African diaspora 
with an, an African instrument. And so that was the, the idea behind it. Brilliant. I like it. I like it. Okay. Yep. Very, yep. very, very uh, interesting one, that. And then I think uh, one last question from my side. Um, Boomshaka says, uh, I would also like to know who both Dr. Boa and Dr. Chavez uh, are rooting for in the next World Champs, Carlson or Nepo? I don't know who wants to go first, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you know, I, I must say, Calvin, that I'm now one of those guys that um, I I watch chess because I enjoy the games. And for me, if Nepo wins, great. If Carlson wins, great. But I'm going to be enjoying each moment when they play. And um, I don't know if I've got a particular favorite at, at this stage, but um, just to say Carlson's coach visited South Africa, uh, Simon Achtestein years ago and then of course uh, we've also got a good relationship with Russia so I'm not sure but I'm going to enjoy the chess that's my safe answer <laughs> well okay I'll, I'll answer it definitively I, I've covered one world championship the one that was in New York where Karyakin uh, challenged Magnus Carlsen uh, I, I actually flew to New York and I was there for several days covering um, the event uh, very interesting. My very first world championship that I covered live. And a lot of people don't realize that that match was actually tied after the 12 games and they went into tie breaks. And of course, Carlson dominated and he ended the, the match with the queen sacrifice on H6, you know, leading to mate. Uh, and that was a magical moment. But I think for, for me, um, and I'm I like Vichy. I like his, I think he's one of the most unheralded world champions that we've had. But I think this particular uh, matchup here, Carlson and Nepo Mayachi, I think, um, and I'm a journalist and I'm supposed to be, I'm biased, right? <laughs> and I'm and I'm actually, <laughs> yeah. this, but I'm, I, I think that Carlson will have an advantage um, uh, in this match. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that I want Nepo to lose, but in, in my view, I think Carlson will, will have an advantage, even though he has trouble against Nepo. He has difficulties. Mm. And so it mm. will be interesting to see how this plays out, but I, I still would give the edge to, to, to Carlson, and I would be perfectly happy uh, if he won. Uh, as far as Nepo winning... I had a, some, some kind of um, impression of Nepo when he was in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, his behavior was not the best um, during that tournament and uh, in Africa. And so that, that maybe have tainted my, my view of him slightly. But um, certainly right. if he wins, you know, he's still the world champion and you have to respect that. Okay, so, some, so. some nice uh, uh, politically correct answers here I'm getting on the show. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Interesting <laughs> stuff. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's it for now. Uh, viewers, you can still throw in sure. more questions. Try to keep it chess related as well, guys. So um, I'm going to hand over to you, uh, Lyndon, and yeah, talk to you guys soon. Thanks. Thanks, Calvin. So, uh, Daim, I just got a message from uh, Vintuk, Namibia, and um, a gentleman called Charles Ahab says, thanks to Daim for his remarkable consistency in keeping the drumbeat alive. His work is never in vain, and he's met you at a few Olympiads, and he says he even has triple exclaim that he's, that he's still studying there that he got from you in, in Batumi 2018. Definitely. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny, um, the Triple X Glam is a book that I think would appeal to the African diaspora. And it's just a shame that it costs so much to, to send these books. Um, uh, but what I have now yeah. is print on demand. So those books can be actually printed in a number of countries because they have a file. And all it is needed is that it to be ordered and then that printer will print it out wherever that um, wherever that printer is located in that country. So it is available sure. in other countries, but it's print on demand. So um, I, I think it's something no, that we'll, one would appreciate. We'll, we'll make sure that we get some copies here in South Africa. Da Daim, um, a question to from me now, because one of the things is uh, I met you at the 2004 Olympia. That, that was our first sort of interaction there. And, and I know you've got some great photos of, of those years that we were in, in Spain. 
of the six Olympiads, which was your favorite Olympiad that you that you went to? So I went to Calvia in Spain, 2004. I went to um, uh, Torino, which was 2006. I went to Dresden, Germany, 2008. I skipped um, Kantimansisk in 2010. I went to uh, Istanbul, Turkey, uh, Tromsø, Norway, and then I went to Batumi. I would have to say that Norway was the most interesting tournament. Um, now, I, I say that with some type of reservation because that was also the tournament where I saw a very um, deep discord because that was the year of the election. And yeah. Kasparov and Kirsan Eugenov were competing for the presidency. And it was you know, very unfortunate that the uh, African caucus was divided the way it was. And, and that really saddened me but that was a memorable event. And I have uh, good memories of, of, of Trumpso, Norway, and my interactions and my interviews. Um, Batumi was a, a pretty good Olympiad, but there was some logistical issues. Um, my first Olympiad was um, probably one of my most memorable in Spain because I because it's the first time I was meeting yeah. a lot of people. And so that really impressed yeah. me was meeting all these people I had been writing about for um, three the past uh, three years since since I started. Uh, but yeah, they all yeah. they all were, were um, special in a way. But of course, the first one was memorable, and then Trumpso Norway was memorable because of the 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 um, uh, the energy, and I was able to yeah. well, they, they can... the assemblies, and I was able to cover it in do a lot of great interviews as well. No, I, I think you, you're right. I mean, 2004, Spain, great Olympiad. I mean, they, they had the opening ceremony on the beach. You know, that, that was very interesting. And um, uh, I've been fortunate to, to have attended uh, quite a number of Olympiads. I've actually attended eight Olympiads. And uh, uh, for me, probably 92 in Philippines, the first one for South Africa, 94, Moscow was, uh, was fantastic as well. But I mean, all of these countries, I mean, you, you mentioned Turkey 2012. That was, of course, where, where Kenny Solomon got a double GM norm. Were, were yes. you covering that uh, I event? Was covering that. I was definitely covering that. And that was great news that he was able to get the double norm. And uh, it's a very interesting story. I was actually, a, a complaint was filed against me by the Turkish Chess Federation because I reported an incidence of plagiarism in a book that they released. <laughs> oops, oops. And, uh, they actually copied material from a website of a, a colleague of mine. And when I got the book and I was looking through it, I noticed that it was very familiar. So when I went back to my desk and I looked at the site, sure enough, it was verbatim. They took it word for word. And this, so I called the the the, the uh, webmaster and I said, "Did you give them permission to to use your material?" And he says, "No." I said, "Well, they have this book here." And so when that happened, and I wrote the story, they they uh, filed a complaint against me with the ethics committee. So that was a memorable. That was a very memorable tournament in a lot of ways. Uh, of for, course, of course. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Olympiads are always going to have these side stories of. Uh, you yep. know, and travel adventures and getting lost in, in these types of things and, you know, different types of food and seeing all the players in their different outfits and jackets. I mean, it's always magical. So we're actually trying yep. to get the Olympiad. I'm pushing to get the Olympiad in the United States um, in the future. And I would hope that South Africa yep. will renew the bid because it had a bid in 2014 uh, and it lost to the uh, Republic of Georgia, but hopefully we can get an Olympiad in Africa one of these uh, one of these years in the future. Yeah. No, you you're absolutely right, uh, Daim, because of course, uh, uh, in terms of world events, there are two world events that have not yet come to Africa. The Olympic Games has never been held in Africa. So since 1896. We've not hosted a single Olympic Games. And then, of course, we haven't hosted a chess Olympiad as, as well. So, so, I mean, two of the, the greatest uh, ones. I must tell you. You, and, had and, and, you had the World Cup in 94, right? Was that, what, what year was that? 
Well, we had the Rugby World Cup in 95, and then we had the Cricket World Cup in 2003, and then we had the Football World Cup in 2010. And, uh, yeah. That's right. And, and then in 2023, we'll be having the, the Netball World Cup here in, uh, in South Africa, in, in Cape Town. Daim, I must tell you that 2014 in Tromsø was also significant uh, for me because I met um, Grandmaster Slim Boaziz in uh, Tromsø. Yes. And he was the coach of the Tunisian team. And of course, as you all know, Africa's first grandmaster back in uh, 93. So, I mean, it was fantastic just to, uh, because of course you may know that uh, Boaziz even played in the 67 South tournament that Fisher left. Mm -hmm. That, that interzonal uh, from uh, from that one uh, as well. And, and and I mean, he played there. So so yeah. some great memories on, on, on that side. Um, Calvin, I think we now at 7.42. So I, I know that uh, we're going to go to the games. But can I just ask Daim, what is next? Uh, are you uh, chess drum? We're still going to continue. Are you going to have some more contributors uh, as, as well? Well, you, you know, the site has over 20,000 pages, believe it or not. And if you go no. behind the chess drum and you start going and going and going, you're going to continue to go and there's content. And I believe all of this work has been done in order for me to begin writing these books. And you've, yes. you're, you're starting to crank out your books. And now is my time. I'm going to start putting these books out in volumes. And, but I think going forward, you know, it's unfortunate we're we're in an, uh, a transition where we're not reading like we used to. Yeah. And so what I would like to do is following what most people are doing now is they're doing these uh, video, they're doing webcasts, they're doing podcasts. And so I see myself doing something like that, which will coincide with the release of my book. And then I'll be talking about different um you know, different news stories and different items of history. So I'm looking at doing something more on a, um, with my channel, which I, I have not done much with my YouTube channel, um, but that's something that I will do. I will continue to do stories in terms of uh, writing stories, but probably not the emphasis that I placed on it in the past. But now yeah. I'm, I'm into uh, authorship, writing books, in speaking about this history and then making sure that people have access to it in a very um, condensed form. Daim, we look forward to, to that. And, and of course, that 20,000 pages represents our history and represents our heritage. So please, whatever support you need, uh, you've got many people here in, in, in Africa and, and I'm sure in the rest of the world that would gladly assist in whatever manner or form that, that you may need as, uh, as well. So we look forward to, to, to that new adventure that, uh, that you're having there on, on that side. Now, Daim, we've spoken about you as a journalist, as an academic, and uh, as somebody who studied chess. Now we'd like to see some of your games because of course, Viewers love to see our the games of our of our guests. So, um, Calvin, I'm going to hand uh, him back over to you, and we're going to get on to the 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 lead chess uh, now. And then, of course, Calvin will show the game on on Twitch. Uh, Daim, are you going to steer, or do you want Calvin to steer? Well, I can. Uh, I have the controls here, so I can navigate through the um, through the game. Sure. That's perfect. You can tell us a bit about the background, the background of the game and, and, and where you were, what tournament it was, and, and then you can, can go in, into us there, Daim. So over to you. Okay. Okay, so this um, is the board, is the board up? Yeah, uh, we've got uh, you against Lily Brian at the moment. Is that the one you want to yeah, start Brian with? Lily. Okay, Brian Lily. So, so the World Open, this was 2006, I think. And of course, that's 15 years ago, but um, this game was instructional for a number of different reasons. And Brian Lilly, he's um, probably at this time 2150, um, 2150, something like that. And my rating was slightly lower. And this uh, World Open is the largest um, open tournament in the US. So here you have all of these players from around the world that come to this open tournament because they have decent prize funds. And so it draws a lot of grandmasters and players from overseas. 
and this game here was 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 interesting because uh, I told you I used to play the Night Orf. I used to play the uh, Dragon, Shaveshnikov. I also played the French. I went through a phase of playing the French and the Modern as well. I was just trying out different systems. But then I settled on more solid systems like the Paulson and the Khan and the Tamanov. I started playing those because I felt that those were less concrete and they were a bit more flexible. So in this game against Lily, and both of these games that I'll show are uh, Sicilians, uh, and they have a theme, and that theme is at E5 square, which is going to be, which is going to be key as, as, as you'll see uh, in the game. So starting out, this um, basic uh, Sicilian, this is the Khan, and now he adopts the Maroxy Bind system. I also started to develop an affinity for the Hedgehog setup. Okay. And so I've been playing okay. that for a number of years. It's a very solid system, very flexible. And it's also a system where white can overpress if they're not careful. They can start playing F4, G4. And then before you know it, black plays a B5, D5, E5, sometimes F5. And then the center collapses. And next thing you know, white has a very exposed position. I've won a lot of games like that. Um, this game is a little different in that I took the initiative uh, early and probably played a move that he was not expecting, bishop c5 here. Okay. Now, th this is um, an interesting maneuver is that after uh, sometimes you play uh, knight b3 here, uh, and then you have um, bishop a7, sometimes bishop a7 or bishop e7. But I decided to, to uh, since he went to c2, I played differently. I kept the bishop there as, um, of course, um, this uh, attacking piece here. So uh, we'll see how the game unfolds. Now, my intentions are, are, are probably pretty clear here. And you play a move mm. like h5. Here we go. Uh, there's, there's some traps here, some tricks here, uh, obviously. And he probably uh, was, was caught off guard uh, after h5. Because, I mean, you wouldn't normally see, see a move uh, like that, although there are some games in the database with, uh, with h5. Now, he starts to make some mistakes here. And this is um, the first one. Now, because obviously now I have a mate thread on the board. And you think easily so at the same time, yes. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's um, probably he strategically, um, this is a strategically, I think it's a strategically fatal error here already. Yes, yes because his, his structure is getting ruined. But what, what should he play instead of bishop e3? Is h3 okay? Probably something like that, right? Yeah, h3. He can he can play h3. But then some people will say, well, you can still play knight, knight g4. Knight g4 at some matter. point. At some point, maybe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because you can always, uh, you know, you have uh, a lot of tricks on the h file. Yes. But yeah, this, I, I knew that this was going to be problematic for him because of this e5. We talked about the e5 knight. Now, if yep. you're ever yep. playing white, you have to avoid allowing black to get that knight to e5 like this, because if you allow knight to get an e5 on this square, one player I know calls this a Godzilla knight. <laughs> it just sits there and it controls the entire board because it's, I mean, you can't move it. And so, you know, you have, it's, it's, it's controlling all these key squares, it's attacking, and it's just very, it's, it's just very unpleasant. Um, to have that knight there. It's hard for you to coordinate your pieces. And so he now is under a lot of pressure. We're at move 14. And he, he's under tremendous pressure here. You're already knocking on the door here yeah. at move 14, yes. Already. Mm. The H file is about to come open. Now I do end up making some inaccuracies. But of course, if I take the pawn here, if, if we go back, and let's say I take the pawn here. There's, um, it, it's going to be problematic if I, I'm going to run into rook c1. 
And you're running out of uh, active yeah. pieces as well. I mean, if you look at the bishop on c8, all your other pieces mm -hmm. are in the game. So, yeah, yeah now because he's you know, he's he's threatening knight d5, and so maybe, I wanted to keep. You know, maybe going. not worth uh, trading that Godzilla uh, for for the bishop on e2. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Because this bishop is not really doing much, and it's hemmed in by its, these two pawns. So. Yeah. Um, I guess that's another another instru instructional point. So now that H file is going to come open. He won't be able to avoid it without weak, further weakening his, his position. So he plays um, King G2, anticipating that I'm now going to open the H file. And so he can swing the F1 rook over to the H file. Um, but now I want to exploit this this um, diagonal. I want to come here and then, of course, keep my eye on this king. And so b6, queen d4. And he's trying to get some counterplay against my uh, queen side. Now he's threatening um, the pawn here. Of course, I'm not really worried about that pawn because what mm -hmm. really matters is the fact that I have all of this pressure here. Yes. Yep. This, is, this is what matters. This this B6 pawn is not really going to, to, to be something that I'm going to hold on to. So uh, I continue. I continue with F5. Now, actually, I looked at this. I should play take, take, and then F5. This would be stronger because now he can't play rook H1 because then I'm winning his rook. Mm. So I probably should open the file first and then play f5, but I sure. ended up playing sure. f5. And so he takes the pawn. And now my attack begins to rage. And notice I have a bishop on e4 and I have a knight, the Godzilla knight on e5. So I'm basically controlling a lot of squares in his uh, position. Mm. So now this is just going to, to, to be uh, bad for him, but it's not so easy. It looks like I'm dominating position, but there are, there, are, there are tricks here. So now what do I do? I have a um, good peace, peace, um, peace position. And now he has a problem with his bishop because but if he solves that, then he might be able to wiggle away. Yes. Uh, and, and if he gets his bishop out of the way, he might be able to castle. Uh, but he doesn't have a chance because then I play this thunderbolt. Ooh. Okay. So this is problematic because of because of this uh, intermezzo move. If he takes my my knight, then I'm going to have an in between move of taking on g3, and then he'll be completely busted. Nice. And I think I think he missed that, but of course he has to now uh, make a move. And so now this this gets tricky. So he's actually sacking a piece on e two by taking on. And so I take. Now what is what are, what are his threats? But he has to play this move, obviously. But his threats, and I had to look at this for a very long time because I realized that he has a lot of checks here. Okay. Mm. There's a lot of positions where, uh, say, for example, if I, I play this, then he, he has a perpetual check. He just, he just yeah. continues. And, of course, if I go here, I get made it. Uh -huh. just plays yeah. But, uh, yeah, he just checks me forever, and I, I can't get out of the checks. Yeah. So I'm thinking, I started getting nervous here. I said, okay, now, now what, what am I going to do? How, how do I get out of this mess? I, I can't, there are really no freeing moves. And so I had, to, I had to look at this real hard. So ultimately, I said to myself, I see a combination, but I have to give the rook back. I'm, I'm a rook up, but I had to give it back. And so I saw this combination. So I played queen c5. Okay. So, so he checks. I play queen f8. So I'm going to give I'm going to give the rook back. Okay. Yeah. Take, yeah. Takes. 
takes, here, now he takes. So now what is the position? I'm actually a pawn down, but I, I saw a combination. To oh, the this is nice. Okay, whereas the, the knight is, um, he, he takes the, he takes the, the, um, uh, the piece, but now how does it, his knight get out? Knight doesn't so have a choice. And, and the knight is sitting as if he belongs there on that uh, B8 square because, you know, you normally have a black knight on that square. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. So he can't go to either of these squares. His only move to protect the knight is to take. So he takes, but then I have this move. Yep, nice. there it is. So I actually had to see this when I decided to play queen c5 and give him the rook back and see that his knight is, is, is trapped. Beautiful right. combo, beautiful. Yeah, so at this point, this is just, um, he's just gonna get, get um, made it here. Notice this rook never moved in the game, the entire game. Yep. It's just sitting on a lo one. Lovely game, lovely game, Daim, on, on that side. And of course, I mean, your, your pieces just came into the game with, with some nice power and energy. Yes, no, no, I like it as well. Uh, I, in fact, it's, it's so difficult to, to finish off a game that you start off so viciously with uh, such a, a, a nice little touch at the end. So, nice one there. Yeah. So, so, I'm going to go to the other game since um, sure. we are, if there, maybe there are some questions. Are there any questions on this? No, no questions? No, we don't so have I any questions now. You know, I, I was actually, just enjoyed the game then. I was I was very nervous because I thought when he sacked his rook that he was going to get out with a draw. I thought he was going to have a perpetual. And so I said, okay, sure. you know, what am I going to do? And then I saw the combination to get back the rook and then trap his knight. So I, I that was a very satisfying win uh, against a very decent player. Mm. Nice one. Got so it. this one with um Jeffrey Byfield. Now, this is a story. I have to give you the story. This is the, the tournament where uh, Amon Simatowi, a grandmaster from Zambia, the first grandmaster in south of the Sahara, uh, we were invited uh, by Ian Wilkinson to come to Jamaica and um, just play in this Harold Chan tournament. So we went on a Wednesday night. Uh, we came in, and we were received by the players, and they wanted to play Blitz, and so... Uh, Amon was there giving all kinds of odds and, you know, blitz odds. And, yeah, he was just pretty pretty much cleaning up the place. But it was fun. You know, the Jamaican players were very energetic, and they said, okay, wait until Saturday. We're going to come. We're going to bring it. <laughs> and they were preparing for, for Amon, and it was, um, it was great fun. So uh, he did some interviews, and we played more chess, and we went, visited a school of Jeffrey Byfield, some of his students. And so we had a very good time there. And we had, um, we went to these nice Jamaican restaurants where they have some very delicious cuisine. Ian Wilkinson was a very generous host. But when Saturday came, it was all about the battle. It was all about the war. And Simatowe was the top seed and he was expected to win. And pretty much coasted through the the uh, his uh, his games, but he did have a challenge uh, later on in the tournament. Me, on the other hand, nobody expected anything of me because they thought, okay, he's a journalist, and we know he's a decent player, but we're not focused so much on him. So in my first game, I uh, beat a local player. He was lower rated. Um, the second round, I played, uh, I believe it was Dwayne Rowe who was a national player in Jamaica, uh, former national champion. We drew a very interesting game where I played the center game, E4, E5, D4, queen takes D4. So I'm playing white. Okay. And he was very uncomfortable because you usually don't face a, an opening like that. Yeah. And I had a slight advantage, but we ended up drawing. Then I played Warren Elliott. Uh, I think he's seven-time national champion of Jamaica. Yep, yep, yep. And we played a very wild game. I played the black pieces and I had um, uh, an advantage, but I failed to, to convert that advantage. Then I lost a game uh, where I blundered upon and my opponent had two passes and, and I couldn't stop them and I lost. Uh, Warren, who was watching my game, was very shocked uh, 
when he left uh, the hall and then he came back and saw the position and he had this shocked look on his face, like what happened? <laughs> and I just blundered. I, I just blundered in the position. Then I won my next game. And then the last round game, I played Jeffrey Byfield, uh, whose school we, we visited uh, a couple of days earlier. Now I have to tell you, Jeffrey Byfield is a national master, strong player, we played blitz games when we visited his school, and he basically just had his way with me. He was winning all the games, uh, pushing all of his pawns on the king side, coming down for king side attacks, and so and, and, and he won the game. He won. Uh, he won several games, and so going into the last round, I thought about this, and I said, "Okay, he's going to try to do the same thing, push all of his pawns." And so I said, "Okay, I'm going to prepare for that." So we started this game. He's a Smith Moore player. And I think some of the South African play players may play the Smith Moore as well. And in younger mm. days, I used to take all the pawns and play a number of different defensive setups, what they call the Chicago defense, where you play A6, B5, Rook A7, Rook D7. Then also the uh, defense where you play D6, E6, Knight G, E7, Knight G6. Uh, there are all these systems, and, and also G6, Bishop G7, Fianchetto and the King Bishop. There are all these systems against the uh, Smith Moore. Um, there is a player who has um, written a, a very uh, uh, interesting book, and I'm not going. I'm not doing a commercial here, uh, but it's um, Mayhem with the uh, Smith Moore. You all may have seen that book, but it's a very famous uh, book about the Smith Moore. So, since the theory is so deep, I started saying, okay. I'm going to decline these pawns because everybody is studying the Smith Moore and it's easy to fall into one of those traps. Uh, and so I basically declined the gambit. And you notice similarities with the last game that I just showed you, the same Aroxy bind, and they have the same setup. And so I go for it. Uh, this was actually an earlier, um, this was 2004, whether it's Lily was 2006. So you notice some similarities. Yep. Uh, he plays f4, mm. but instead of playing, of course, I can't play bishop c5 as in the last game, so I play d6. Now I play knight c6 here. Now I don't want to play knight bd7 because then you run into problems. Um, after g4, then you have um, you have to play knight c5 and knight bd7, and things get clumsy. Yep. Uh, yep. He plays bishop to b1 and then b4, and then you, you run into all sorts of problems. So I said, I have to play more active here. Knight c6. Now he may be trying to these little tricks here, because I think in some blitz games, he, he had that shot, um, knight d5, and um, those uh, can be very uncomfortable for, for black. So he plays uh, rook a c1. And then I play queen a5. Now, I'm not so sure about this um, move because if you play a normal move like bishop b7 and he plays knight d5, it's not so bad for, for white. In fact, I have this continuation, which is actually pretty good for black. We just take, and his center collapses. I give back the piece, but then I have a very strong position and his king is exposed. So Where does his in the king go? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I probably should play bishop e7 instead. Um, that's probably the, the better move. But I played queen a5. Now, uh, because I had an idea, and this idea is knowing that he's going to play g4. I knew he was going to play it. So he plays g4. And I had something prepared for him. Can anyone guess the move that, that I played here? Hmm. Sure. So this it, the white pawns is, is is coming for you. Yeah. So the previous game you played h5. I was actually about to ask: Is h5 not going to come somewhere now? Interestingly, interestingly enough, you're inviting g4. Okay. Yeah. Mm. But it, it's pretty. It, this is a critical moment in the game where I have to make some critical decisions. Otherwise, I get crushed. I'm gonna get crushed here if I don't act. If I don't act fast, uh, he's just going to um, he's just going to steamroll me and then like he did in the blitz games. Um, but I wasn't going yeah. to allow that to 
that happened. So I play G5 here. Okay. Yep. The very Sicilian type of situation. They're just giving up the pawn to get the E5. Godzilla knight and winning a piece if allowed. Gary, Gary would be proud of G5. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the idea is you all probably can see how this is going to turn out. It's just going to be all bad, of course. Um, you know, I'm hitting two pieces here, so uh, you can't even you you can't even do that. Mm. You can't even play um, take take the pawn. But he's determined, so he plays h4. He's just coming with everything. Mm. So I played a take. Now this e5 square is undermined, and so I play knight f d7. Now I'm going to yep. bring him here. And I have my Godzilla Knight again. Oh. So Silva Toe saw this game and he says, wow. He says, when you play G5, I said, you're in great form. <laughs> he, <laughs> he, he thought I was in great form by playing, playing, having the courage to play a move like that. Um, but I must tell you, it's an idea I got from Judith Pogar because she played a game against uh, Alexei Shirov where she played G5. It's a very brilliant game. If you don't know the game, you should watch Shirov Judith Pogar, I think it was might have been sometime in the 80s where she played that G5 move uh, and, and had all kinds of queen sacrifices with the black pieces and minor piece mates. Uh, it was absolutely stunning. So I'll, this is where I got that idea I'll, from. I'll, I'll try to find that game as well. I, I remember one game, I think uh, uh, Gary Kasparov and uh, Anand had this battle the night of a lot of battles. And I remember Gary also playing HX and G5 at some point, but not as... Nice as this, just straight away G5. This so, was just straight G5 that Pogar cool. played. She got minor piece play and mates, and uh, it was brutal. So nice. if, you, if you look up that Shirov Pogar game, uh, and that's why she was one of, uh, she was my favorite player until she retired. Uh, I really liked her style of play. Okay. But here, you know, I'm going to get my Godzilla Knight. And of course, he's not going to, to sit idly and, and let me just. Uh, have my way. So now uh, I still have to to be careful because now he's going to play b4 and try to uh, run me off the board. So now I've got some counterplay here with the with the knight and the bishop on the g file. He plays g5 uh, and I hit it again. Okay. Now, of course, this pawn it, he can't sack his queen because this pawn doesn't. Uh, doesn't I always have knight g6, uh, stops the queen. Uh, and so now the dark squares are totally under a lot of pressure and the light squares and his whole position is, um, is crumbling. So now he tries a trick. Obviously I can't take with the pawn because my knight hangs. And if I take with the queen, then he has knight d5. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, um, it's a nice try. Uh, he, he's just trying to confuse me, but um, uh, I had a firm grip on what I wanted to do. So now I play an interesting move, queen d8, getting out of the, the uh, potential attack on my queen that he had. And I play queen d8 with a deadly idea that uh, it's interesting because I said, uh, I wonder, is he going to see the idea I have? And so we, he continues trying to, to confuse me. I take, I was hitting, actually hitting his bishop, but he's yep. just trying for complications. So now I play g4. So I'm looking at this square here, obviously. Yep. So that gives you an idea of what um, I'm brewing. So after I play g4, I get up from the board and I go outside and I get some fresh air. I wanted to put this critical moment on his mind so that he is forced to find the right move under pressure without me at the board. So I'm wondering, is he going to see the idea I have? When I came back, he played Bishop F4. Mm. So what do I play here? He's hitting my knight and I have to figure out what to do to stop my advantage from um, dissipating. Sure, so, you've got all kinds of little little uh, tricks and moves here. The question is, which one is best? Uh, 
Any guesses oh. from Twitch? I'm looking. Any guesses? Any guesses there? It, it seems. Because uh... I, you know, if I don't, if if I don't force the issue, then I'm going to end up losing my advantage. So my move was Bishop H4. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Four so things. so uh, obviously the Godzilla Knight playing ahead. a key role over here uh, once again. So that Godzilla Knight is is um is very key. So he takes a take again. Ah, so there you you're going for the little trick there on F3. And okay, he tries to confuse me. He takes the knight. I take again. Uh, yep. Obviously, he can't take my knight because his, his queen is pent. Yep. And lovely intermezzo with that bishop takes h4, followed by the queen. So now he's he's uh, still realizing that, okay, he's, um, uh, he's busted here. He's totally busted. Uh, but he continues to, to play on. And now I just have to be careful not to liquidate too much. Um, I'm a clear exchange up, uh, exchanging two pawns up. I just have to make sure that uh, I don't fall for any any tricks. Funny business, yes. Yeah. 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 I just have to make sure I don't fall for uh, any uh, any of those uh, blunders. So now he's uh, backpedaling, and now it's just uh, a matter of time before I get the Godzilla Knight again. How much? How now much? I'm, actually, I'm just wondering how much do you value? How much uh, points do you put on a Godzilla night there? Three and a half, four. <laughs> it's be at least five. <laughs> <laughs> this, this night here has got to be at least five here. I mean, if, if you can get that night there and keep it there, uh, it's probably uh, uh, as powerful as a rook. Uh -huh. I mean, if, if you think about it. But um, okay, so uh, I'm just going to. The last few yeah. few moves here, he's um, obviously in, in very deep trouble here um, because now I'm hitting this square with my rook and he's trying to confuse me. So then I switch. Uh, now I'm trying to trade off pieces and this is where the final blow is. Oof. I rook d3 and he resigned here. So and God, Godzilla has a final final say there, Calvin. Wow, nice, <laughs> nice tactics, great game. No, lovely, lovely stuff, Daim. And as I think Amon was correct uh, to say that your eye was in, 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 in this game. Yeah, in this game, I, I felt pretty good uh, winning, especially since he trashed me in all the blitz games uh, a day earlier. So I felt, uh, and, and we had an analysis session after this. We must have been analyzing for an hour and a half. I mean, there are so many, I didn't go through all the variations, but there were so many different tactics involved here and queen sacrifices and um, that black could have um, could have had had we gone into certain variation. But this, this win was very satisfying because I ended up with four points out of six, uh, one loss and, you know, a, a few wins and a couple of draws. And um, not, not only that, we had a great time. It's um, some thing that I always cherish, the memory I always cherish with uh, Ammon, and um, we always talk about this um, whenever I, whenever yep, I talk no, to No, no, it's fantastic, and I mean, well done on, on these two great victories, because I mean, uh, great instructive games as, as well, Calvin, and of course, um, one would have to be careful with this E6 uh, system that uh, uh, Dr. Shabazz uh, espouses here. And of course, uh, you must always protect your e5 squared seams uh, exactly. as well, Daim. But uh, well, well done on the game, there. Calvin. Your take? No, excellent stuff over here. I like that both of them were actually this, this uh, pause and uh, you know I used to play the time enough a lot. I enjoy these uh, structures and uh, two different types of games. One uh, one going with h5 classical uh, uh, counter attack, and this one here g5 x clam. I would say. So um, very, very interesting, <laughs> interesting stuff. I guess that's why you play the Sicilian, right? To get these type of games. That's, that's exactly so. why. Because it's, it's, you, you don't, 
you don't go into 30 moves uh, analysis uh, because I used to play the dragon and it would go 30 moves. And I said to myself, I can't keep up. Shaveshnikov, same thing. I knew some yes. lines, 30 moves. And I couldn't keep up. And I felt that I needed to play something that was a little bit more flexible and less concrete, less forcing. And so then I started picking up these systems and learning the nuances. I had a book by Kasparov, which was the, the uh, Shavinigan. Uh, you may be familiar with that book. Mm -hmm. you wrote in yeah. I studied that, and that was also yeah. a, a very big help. Because a lot of white players that, that you know, play against a Sicilian, they'll play, try F4, G4, they'll move all their pawns in E5, and they'll try all these lines against black, and, and they a lot of times backfire because you know black has these resources. Yes. And the yes. center just opens yep. up, and then yep. black has all these pieces coming down, and it's just, you know. Uh, so that's a lesson. If you have a white, you, know, you want to be cautious of overstepping and trying for these uh, kamikaze attacks and because uh, Black has resources, as Kasparov proved many years that Black um, and uh, Vachier Legraf is proving that the Night Orf is, is also a weapon um, to, uh, that is a, a fierce weapon for Black. Excellent stuff, excellent tactics as well to go along with it, uh, Daim, so excellent stuff over there, well done. Yeah, no, I, I think Daim, thanks very much for 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 showing us these two games and uh, and also just sharing some of your philosophy in terms of uh, wanting to cover the the diaspora, uh, African players and 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 black players in general, and and then also, I mean, you've. Um, You've really shown that uh, you love covering up-to-date events. And I mean, whenever there's a tournament happening, African Championship, World Championship, uh, we follow your your uh, um, journalism, uh, whether it be on on the um, uh, WhatsApp groups that, that we have nowadays, because people post things very, very quickly as uh, as well. But Dane, from my side, uh, um, thank you very much for agreeing to be on the show. And we look forward uh, to continue our relationship with you whenever we see you again. And I just want to say the WhatsApp group, the African WhatsApp group is absolutely wonderful. I, I love the energy. I don't read all the comments, but I think that is going to be crucial for the development of not only African chess, but also planning, planning, tossing around ideas, thinking about how can we improve the standard of chess in Africa? I think the WhatsApp group is wonderful and I'm glad to be a part of it. Excellent stuff. Uh, also, thanks, just from my side, uh, Daim, thanks for joining us. It was lovely having you here with us this evening. And uh, yeah, now I know a, a bit more about you. I'm actually gonna do a bit more research. I'm gonna also check out that game that you recommended. Uh, uh, um, yes, you know, love and 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 Polgar. And Sean in the chat says, uh, "I like uh, the Godzilla Knight. I'm going to be looking for opportunities to get one myself of the game." <laughs> so excellent and, stuff. Uh, and Calvin, uh, Charles, hey, sir, Charles of the uh, said of the previous game. Wow, fantastic hedgehog, truly in the spirit of the system. And he was referring to that first game when he sent me the comment from, from Namibia. So, uh, so Daim, we, we had uh, people from all over Africa watching tonight. So thank you very much uh, for being on the show. Thank you so much. Thank yes. You. And if you just hang on for one more second, Daim, uh, I just want to ask uh, London, then, who do we have next week on, on Reflections? So, Calvin, we, we had uh, from Florida, we had Professor Daim Shabazz. And uh, next week we go, as they would say, over the pond. They go to, to London and we have Professor Barry Heimer from uh, the London University. And he's written a book now called How to Improve Your, your, your Chess. And uh, Professor Heimer is originally from South Africa, having moved there, and he's going to talk us through about his chess career and also a bit about the book that uh, I'm busy reading at the moment as well. Excellent stuff. So thanks so much, guys. This has been a lovely episode. I'm going to look at a bit more Sicilians this evening. Thanks, uh, Dr. Chavez. Thanks, Dr. Boa. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Calvin. Yes, cheers. See you later. Bye. Bye.